Let's take a look at the clonal selection of antibody producing cells next. Here's the issue. You're going to have to make a very specific IgG molecule that, spine, that binds exclusively to one type of antigen. And you can't afford making a mistake. It's like a key and lock principle. So you need to basically use a generic antibody, an IgG, that is sort of raw. And then by a mix and match kind of procedure, you need to make something on the tip of the IgG that fits perfectly to the antigen that it's made for. So it's basically taking a generic key and cut it specifically to fit for a lock. Now, the way the immune system does it, it's using the major histocompatibility complex, the MHC genes, to sort of differentiate between self and foreign and then make a specific target against the foreign particle. Um, class 1 MHC molecules are on the membrane of nucleated animal cells, sort of for self-identification purposes. And class 2 MHCs are on the surface of antigen-presenting cells, or APCs, including B cells. So let's take a look at this. Inactive B cells contain surface IgG that bind to the antigen. The B cell then internalizes and processes the antigen. Antigen fragments are displayed on MHC class 2 molecules. And really, here's the critical thing. The helper T cell contacts the displayed antigen fragment and releases cytokines that activate B cells. This really is the critical thing right here. Then the B cell undergoes proliferation or clonal expansion, and that's the process by which we are trying to make a very specific antibody against the target. And it takes some time, so yes, yeah, so the activation of B cells to produce antibodies. Um, step one would be the B cell receptor recognizes and attaches to the antigen. Then the antigen is internalized into the B cell. Fragments of the antigen are presented on MHC proteins to the surface of the cell. And on four, helper T cell that recognizes this antigen fragment is activated, releases cytokines, and that activates the B cell. And now we have to go through this process of clonal selection. And this takes some time. It's like really making a custom-made item. And um, I'm going to have to go through trial and error, throw out a bunch of the ones that didn't work, and then eventually going to end up with something that works. So it's like cutting a key, and it just takes time. So the um, clonal selection of antibody-producing cells. Clonal selection differentiates activated B cells into antibody-producing plasma cells, currently antibody-producing plasma cells. And once the infection or whatever caused the um, pr production of this antibody is done, because it was so much work, we'll need to keep memory cells around. These are samples of the B cell clone that learned how to make a specific antibody. If for some reason we made a bad B cell that didn't work or was attacking the wrong thing, then we need to do clonal deletion, which eliminates any kind of harmful B cells. Steps of the clonal selection and differentiation of B cells Starting out with stem cells to differentiate into mature B cells. Then the B cell encounters a specific antigen and proliferates. It starts dividing. And think of it as a mix and match kind of process. It's going to take some time to make the right antibody. And then uh, some B cells proliferate into long-lived memory cells. So after the infection is done, uh, so here, first of all, the antigen inter antibody interaction has to work. And then once the infection is done, the plasma cells that are actively secreting antibodies, here they're churning out these antibodies by the thousands. Once the infection is done, we don't need this antibody anymore. Then we're going to generate memory cells that are long-lived, they stay around, and if you ever see this same antigen again, you can convert memory cells into B cells quickly, and then they churn out these antibodies again as you need it. As your B cells respond, 
uh, the two different types of responses. One is to the T-dependent antigen, where the antigen requires a helper T cells, helper or the interaction of a helper T cell to produce antibodies. And then the T-independent antigens, they stimulate B cells without the help of the helper T cells. That's usually a weak immune response. So you want to stick with this. The T-dependent antigen with the help of T-cell activates a line of um, B-cells and then they make the correct antibody. Also, to mention here, the T-independent antigens, no memory cells are generated. That's not good. That's not what you want. You want to have memory cells after you've put in all the work to make the right antibody. You want to convert your plasma cells into memory cells. Here's a diagram showing T-independent antigens. And so again, this is a weak immune response. You have your epitopes right here. You have B-cell receptors. You don't need any help of T-cell or any antigen presenting cell. So um, this is not the preferred method. Now let's take a look at antigen antibody binding and its results. An antigen antibody complex forms when the antibodies bind to the antigens. The strength of the bond is called the affinity, and usually it's very good if you made a good antibody. Uh, you protect it protects the host for, uh, by tagging foreign molecules or cells for destruction, and it leads to agglutination, with so basically a precipitation reaction, opsonization. That means you're helping your phagocytic cells to find anything that they need to digest by coating whatever microbe it is or some pathogen with antibodies. And then the macrophages or the neutrophils have an easy time. You have antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, now it's T cells, and um, um, specific lines of T cells, they will find this tagged pathogen and then kill it. You have also neutralization and then the activation of complement system because when an antibody binds to an antigen, then the stem region of the antibody changes the shape and it will create a binding site for the first component of complement. Here are the different results of antigen antibody binding. So you can get agglutination, which is basically precipitating out a bunch of these pathogens. Opsonization means it makes it easier for a phagocytic cell to find what it should engulf and internalize and digest. Neutralization, as uh, shown right here, this works really well for viruses actually. And then antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. Uh, this would be an eosinophil right here dropping um, these little granules here that are filled with hydrolytic enzymes onto a large parasite, like a worm, for example. And then the activation of complement, which is um, the stem region of the antibody here. Uh, after it has bound, after the antibody has bound to its target cell, then the first the um, complement binding site on the stem region of the antibody right here becomes available, and the first component of complement will be activated, eventually leading to the membrane attack complex and the lysis of the pathogen. Now let's take a look at the process of the cellular immunity response. So this hinges on T cells and they combat or fight intracellular pathogens. They do mature in the thymus, if you still have one. The thymic selection eliminates immature T cells. They migrate from the thymus to lymphoid tissues, and then they attach to antigens via T cell receptors. That's the important thing, T cell receptors. And then the pathogens entering the, for example, the gastrointestinal tract, they have to go through microfold cells, these M cells, located over pious patches, you may have heard that, and then they transfer antigens to lymphocytes and antigen-presenting cells. So let's take a look at that next. Here are some of these M cells on pious patches, and here on panel B we have M cells facilitating the contact between antigens passing through the intestinal tract and um, cells of the e immune system. So moving on to antigen-presenting cells. This is really an important concept, antigen-presenting cells. That's exactly what the name says. That's what they do. They present antigens 
potentially dangerous or characteristic surface structures from an from a pathogen. Uh, they present that to the rest of the immune system. Basically, <clears throat> the cell that all of this hinges on is the helper T cell, Th, the helper T cell. Uh, on the other hand, we have also some other cells that are involved. Let's start out here with the dendritic cells. DC, they engulf and degrade microbes and display them to T cells. They're found in skin, genital tract, lymph nodes, spleen, thymus, and blood. Macrophages. They are really good at becoming antigen pre presenting cells. They are activated by cytokines or the ingestion of antigenic material. Then they migrate to lymphoid tissue and present the antigen to T cells. So here is a dendritic cell to start out with. And then here will be an active activated macrophage. Let's see that. And here, let's take a look at the classes of T cells. Um, maybe we have these clusters of differentiation, CDs. Um, basically, that's a way of naming different types of um, receptors on T cells. So what happened was that um, as people discovered receptors on lymphocytic cells, they started to name them different ways. And everybody tried to attach their own, I don't know, touch to the whole thing. So it, it became out of control because um, everybody named the same thing different names. And it became very confusing to everybody. And so there was a conference and they decided to name these T cell receptors um, CDs, clusters of differentiation, and then attach numbers to it. So, for example, CD4 plus cells have the cluster of differentiation number four in their plus, so that means they have it. That is usually a hallmark of the helper T cells. Um, CD4. CD8 plus cells, those are cytotoxic T lymphocytes, for example. They bind MHC class 1 molecules. Helper T cells bind MHC class 2 molecules. But um, here, so I guess the take home message is the cluster of differentiation. That's a way of naming or differentiating different types of T cells based on the surface receptors that they have. Let's start with the helper T cells. And they are CD4 plus T cells. So that means they have the cluster of differentiation number four. They're positive for that type of receptor. And uh, let me just uh, say one word about this um, naming these types of cells helper T cells. Uh, they really are nothing lowly like helper or something that is not very significant, what the name seems to indicate. Helper T cells, they should be called marshals, maybe uh, generals or something like that. They're that important. They're super important. And you can see what it does to your immune system when you have uh, a virus that infects these helper T cells and brings their numbers down. And that would be HIV. HIV infects helper T cells. And then once their numbers drop significantly, you're going to have you're going to have the immune immune deficiency syndrome. So you're going to have AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Why? Because helper T cells are super important for activating other branches of the immune system. So T cell receptors on the helper T cells, they recognize and bind antigen fragments and MHC class 2 on the antigen presenting cells, the APCs. APC or T helper cells, they secrete a co-stimulatory molecule and activating helper T cells. Helper T cells produce cytokines and they differentiate into these types of helper um, T helper cells. And this diagram here shows the activation of helper T cells. You have a macrophage right here that's ingesting an antigen and digesting it. And it's becoming an antigen presenting cell by displaying the surface structure of these, um, these whatever was displayed on the surface of the antigen. It's embedding into an MHC class uh, 2 molecule. And now the helper T cell is latching onto this and trying to figure out a strategy. So now the helper T cell, as it is interacting with the antigen presenting cell that's displaying the antigen, 
that is embedded into an MHC class 2 molecule. Now this helper T cell is going off and activating other types of immune system cells.